Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I have selected this uh, topic for debate this afternoon because I believe that the uh, National Development Framework 2020 to 2040, which was published recently, uh, poses for Mid and West Wales in particular the environmental equivalent of Henry VIII's despoliation of churches and monasteries. In the foreword to this document, the First Minister says that by 2040 we know there are significant challenges to be met, not least in tackling climate change, which he believes is the defining issue of our time, and tackling the causes and mitigating climate change is a key consideration in our plans and hopes for Wales. And uh, Julie James, in her foreword to the document, says that uh, we should make sure that we build a society and an economy that is flexible and resilient. And I want to explore the conflict which I believe exists between these two propositions. Uh, the conflict, in fact, between economic growth and tackling climate change, I quote from the foreword in the name of the First Minister, having clear visions of renewable energy. And so uh, what I think we need to understand is the answer to the question, does economic growth trump climate change mitigation or having visions of more renewable energy? I believe that the overwhelming majority of the people of Wales are far more interested in economic growth and improving their standard of living than the airy-fairy notions of an undeliverable climate change target, <coughs> which governments actually have no possibility of influencing. Wales is, after all, the poorest of all the uh, UK nations and uh, regions of England on the latest GVA figures. And I believe that the Welsh Government should make economic growth its top priority. Uh, in the early stage of the document, this is never made entirely clear. Uh, later com uh, comments, however, do let the cat out of the bag. It appears that talking climate change, decarbonisation and creating more renewable energy sources are the key aim, regardless of economic growth, supporting tourism or indeed changing landscapes. On page 36 of the document, uh, it says that the government aims to tackle the causes of climate change and has a, a key commitment to carbonisation. It also says that the Welsh Government will work with relevant stakeholders to help unlock the renewable energy potential of these areas and the economic and environmental benefits they can bring to communities. But nowhere does it say that economic development and the consequent benefit that uh, it brings will be the highest priority for Welsh communities. Uh, when we look at Wales' place in the world and its contribution to global warming, we find that its contribution is absolutely insignificant, 0.06% of global CO2 emissions. I believe that the kind of economic burdens which will be imposed by our zero carbon commitments will impose a very, very significant burden upon the people of Wales and most particularly those who are least able to bear such burdens. We know that there are many uh, pressing issues in Wales. The PISA results are going to show yet again that we have the worst education results in the country. The state of the health service again is an absolute scandal with five of our seven health boards in special measures or targeted intervention. If we're going to spend public money at all, I believe it should be on improving health and education and the and the well-being of ordinary people rather than in building more wind farms and solar panel farms uh, dispo despoliating the countryside. Uh, because whatever we do in this country is going to make no difference whatsoever to <coughs> global warming. That's the fundamental backstop of this issue. You know, China and India, as I never tire of pointing out, are responsible for 36% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. And China is planning to double its output of carbon dioxide in the next 15 years. India is planning to triple <laughs> its global emissions, uh, its, its emissions of carbon dioxide. China is even now building 300 coal-fired power stations, not just in China, but also around the world as part of its geopolitical uh, priorities of extending China's political reach. They're building them in Africa, in Turkey, and in many other countries. The United States, of course, has responded to this. President Trump thinks that it's important that the United States should not bear the burden of these climate change policies if other countries are actually going in the opposite direction. 
he wants to resign from the Paris Accords altogether uh, because he said he was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh and not Paris. Well, I believe that Welsh Government should take the view that they were elected to represent the citizens of Port Talbot and not Paris. What motivates Trump is that there is a let out clause in the Paris Agreement that exempts the worst uh, and most recalcitrant polluters if you think that CO2 is a pollutant. Article 4.7 of the Paris Agreement says the extent to which a developing country will effectively implement its commitments under the Convention will take fully into account economic and social development and poverty eradication are the first and overriding priorities of the developing country parties. So there's an explicit commitment in the Paris Accords to put economic development ahead of everything else for developing countries, which include even economic powerhouses as they are now becoming of China and India. So China and India have signed up in principle to the uh, fundamental theories behind the Climate Change Convention, but they're not actually going to do anything to reduce their contributions to uh, the uh, global emissions uh, which we currently emit. Uh, and uh, in fact, they're going to go in the opposite direction. They're going to do even more. Even Germany, which is fully committed to the aims of the Convention, uh, is going in the opposite direction too. In each of the last eight years, including this year, CO2 emissions have risen in Germany. Uh, the great uh, uh, cheerleader under Angela Merkel for more and more uh, penal policies on global warming for the peoples of Europe. So last year, China had a nearly 5% increase in its global emissions and India 7%. India in 2018 increased its global emissions by 10 times Wales's total annual output of CO2. So even if we were able to close down the entire Welsh economy, uh, and even indeed if Wales didn't exist on the planet, suddenly was vaporised, India would make up the gain to the world in CO2 reductions in a mere five weeks. So why are we actually going to impose these massive burdens upon the people of Wales? And they're not just economic burdens, of course, they are environmental burdens as well. I believe that the conscious, deliberate policy of imposing such burdens upon the people least able to bear them is actually grossly immoral, as well as absurd, because they won't achieve their objects. Wales needs economic development and it needs poverty eradication because even on the latest report of the Welsh Government fuel poverty in Wales stands at 12 percent that is an eighth of our population that has to spend more than 10 percent of its income on keeping warm in the winter. Large-scale renewable energy schemes are, of course financed by ordinary people and the money is transferred to major development companies and it's the largest transfer of wealth that's occurred in my lifetime from the poor to the rich. Rather surprising that a Labour government is countenancing such a policy and indeed pursuing it so enthusiastically. Uh, of course, the Welsh economy is changing. The old-fashioned industrial base of Wales uh, has gone or, or is going. We're developing more and more rapidly into a service economy. In 2010, there were 39,000 500 businesses in financial services, financial and business services, that's gone up to 53,500 in 2018. And there were in 2010 52,000 retail and tourist businesses, that's now gone up to 60,000. These are the kind of businesses which Mid Wales is going to see as in its future. And therefore, the extent to which these climate change policies are going to make it more difficult for tourism and related industries to make a profit is going to have a significant impact upon the economic well-being of my region. There is a presumption in this document in favour of uh, development for wind farms and similar schemes, which are going to desecrate the, the landscape. I drove from Glasgow down to Carlisle uh, a few weeks ago. I hadn't been there for a great many years years and I was amazed that every single hilltop uh, along that uh, stretch of road seemed to be covered with windmills. Absolutely appalling, completely ruined the view for anybody who was interested in visiting that part of the country in order to enjoy the countryside. I don't want to see that happen to mid and west Wales because I believe that not only is that wrong aesthetically, but I believe it will also have a massively adverse economic impact upon our region. 
Uh, Ogden Nash, the American uh, comic and uh, a comic writer, uh, wrote in the 1930s when billboards were popping up along major road uh, routes through America. He wrote and said, I think I shall never see a billboard lovely as a tree. Perhaps, unless the billboards fall, I'll never see a tree at all. Well, I feel that the uh, windmill or wind turbine is today the equivalent of 1930s bills, we billboards. We introduced advertising controls directly as a result of uh, the development of advertising boards along the arterial roads leading out of London in the 1930s. Yet now we have a government which is deliberately and quite consciously uh, going to wreck our countryside, all in the name of some mythical uh, target which we can never actually reach. So this is massively unpopular, of course, uh, with the people who are going to live with these things. The, uh, the Council for the Pres Preservation of Rural Wales, I declare an interest as a member of it, has said that widespread industrialisation and irrational destruction of our landscapes is what is in prospect here. Acceptance of landscape change can't be assumed. It must be democratically mandated. In England, onshore wind farms require majority local approval, and Welsh communities should have no lesser rights. I fully support that objective. The Plaid Cymru leader of Gwynedd Council has described this uh, framework as comedy gold and said that this document isn't fit for purpose in tackling the needs of rural Wales and the market towns that feed the wider economy. I don't agree with Plaid Cymru on much, but I do agree with him on that. Uh, well, <laughs> Welsh Government uh, does uh, uh, believe that Wales will benefit from inward investment and economic growth as, as a result of uh, these renewable energy schemes. I don't believe that there's any evidence that that is possible. Just look at some of the projects which uh, have uh, uh, been proposed and have been completed so far. Let's take the three schemes at Hendy, Brindline and Ross Crowther. These wind farms uh, all have their own companies, but they all have the same registered office at 7A Howick Place, London, SW1P1DZ, and they all list a Stephen John Radford as director. A company based in Shrewsbury called Viento Environmental Limited, uh, run by a Frank Iribar, has also been involved. And this is all being directed by another London company called U and I Group Limited. There's no Welsh uh, involvement whatsoever in this development. As I said earlier, I believe it's the largest transfer of money from the poor to the rich in my lifetime. Labour pose as the Robin Hood of society, but in fact, uh, there are the allies of the Welsh equivalent of the Sheriff of Nottingham. Uh, in the case of the Hendy wind farm, as is well known, it was rejected by Montgomeryshire County Council. It was then further rejected by the planning inspector appointed by the minister herself. And then she overrode the planning inspector's report. She had the legal power to do it. I don't believe she had the moral power to do it because it's as though it was never worth having the inquiry in the first place because the Labour government's policy priority of decarbonisation and renewable energy overrode all the objections which the planning inspector raised in the course of his, his report. Um, the Bryn Blind scheme uh, at Llangirig uh, apparently has never actually even generated a vote or watt of electricity. Uh, and uh, I see from the latest uh, accounts of, of, uh, uh, of the company who is developing it that they have uh, projected targeted gains for their company of six to eight million pounds. They will get six to eight million pounds out of this without generating the slightest electricity at all and in the process, of course, have erected eyesores in the landscape. I mean, this is utterly, utterly irrational. Uh, Sir so Jack of the North, famous uh, a blogger who, who has been mentioned in, in, the, in the chamber only recently by the ex-leader of Plaid Cymru, um, uh, has said that, uh, to explain what, what has happened here, uh, that you and I, or Development Securities, the company developing it, planned three wind farms of a size so that even if the local planning committees voted against them, their bacon could be saved by the planning inspectorate or, as a last resort, the Welsh Government. No doubt developers had hoped to get planning permission for all three developments, netting them as much as 20 million, 
But being more realistic, they were probably prepared to settle for two of the three. But the High Court going, going against them on Rose Crowther meant they were left with just Bryn Blind. So they were only going to make a small profit. But six to eight million pounds is a lot of money to you and me. I hope uh, you will agree, uh, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And therefore, I believe that uh, this policy is wholly misconceived grossly wrong and, mis uh, and, and immoral, and I believe that it is opposed by the overwhelming majority of people in Mid and West Wales because it poses a tremendous threat, I believe, to the economic future of our region by undermining the very basis of the local service economy. Thank you.